Now, do you think when they got those 39 wax and they were like, don't teach in Jesus' name, do you think any one of the apostles turned around and was like, wait, no, <laughs> Jesus, it's Jehovah. You know, like, they <laughs> you don't get whacked for a mistake 39 times and then walk away rejoicing. I would certainly correct the guy if I was whacked 39 times. <laughs> so these are the questions, guys. These are the questions you have to ask yourself. Why is it that we are so focused on this name of Jehovah? Welcome back to the channel, guys. I am Brandon, this is Born Again XJW, and in today's video, we're going to take a, a look at the book of Acts, actually. <laughs> the reason we're gonna do that is because uh, I'm doing a, a chapter to chapter study of the book of Acts right now. And just as I'm reading it, um, it just got me thinking, especially because of my background of being a former Jehovah's Witness. The reason it got me thinking is because um, I can't tell you how many hours uh, I spent in the field service, the ministry work, going door to door and proclaiming the good news uh, to strangers or what I thought was the good news. <laughs> and that was typically whatever was the subject of the magazine that we were pushing out that day. Now, I realize that that sort of dates me a little bit because we actually had physical Watchtower and Wake magazines that we would give away. That's no longer the case right now. They just point people to the website jw.org and they show them most of the time a little video presentation, something like that. So anyways, my whole purpose behind bringing up the book of Acts and the, the reason it got me thinking was because um, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't know the good news. They're not actually going and proclaiming the gospel in the same way that the first century church did, in the same way that the, uh, the apostles did. So I mean, they say that they do. They say that they're the, the closest representation of the first century church, but if you just read chapter to chapter, Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you're reading through it, you will see a true representation of the gospel that was presented to people after witnessing a miracle and asking brothers, what, what, what must we do? And then they get a true presentation of what the good news or the gospel actually is. And it doesn't look anything or sound anything like what modern day Jehovah's Witnesses are going door to door and sharing. So um, I want to refute two distinct teachings from the Watchtower. Um, actually, I'll let the Bible refute two distinct teachings from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And the uh, first teaching is, is going to be the spiritual resurrected body of uh, Jesus Christ. The, so the, the Watchtower teaches that Jesus didn't come back in a physical body, but he came back in his spirit body. I've actually touched on this in two other videos. I might provide a link to that so you can go and check that out in a little bit further detail. Uh, but then the other thing that's going to be refuted is the fact that the Watchtower teaches that only the 144,000 are born again or have the Holy Spirit. So only the anointed have the Holy Spirit. And I have a big problem with that. Um, I think that one of the order of operations for showing that someone is saved is by following Jesus' um, example when he says, truly I tell you, unless a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom. So, you know, Nicodemus is like, what the heck does that mean? <clears throat> Anyways, I'm sort of skirting off on a side trail here. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into Acts chapter 1. I'm going to read just a couple of verses, and within those couple of verses, that's going to set the tone for this entire video. Okay, so stay with me here. I'll probably highlight the portions that I think are really important when it comes to distinctly refuting these false teachings from the Watchtower. So this is Acts chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm going to read down to verse 7. So it says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, 
It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the the teaching that Jesus came back in a, in a spirit body and didn't come back in a physical body um, is refuted right here in verse 3. It says, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So, again, many convincing proofs that he was alive. And, and okay, so we can say, well, was he alive in the spirit? Was he alive in the body? Well, we're going to uh, pop over into a couple different verses that will talk about the physical state that Jesus was in. Um, again, I can't take one scripture from 1 Peter and say that he was made alive in the spirit, and that proves my point when I've got 75 other verses that talk about his physically resurrected body. So um, that's typically what the Watchtower will try and do is they will try and uh, quote a scripture or half a scripture or even part of a half and try and say, yep, there it is. He was made alive in the spirit. And then they just stop when, of course, the, the rest of the context of the scriptures around it would probably talk about Jesus' physically resurrected body. Again, I've touched on that in other videos, but let's go ahead and hit some of those other verses real quick to just talk about um, the proofs that Jesus actually had a physical body when he came back. All right, so let's go to the book of Matthew. We're going to go to chapter 28, and we're going to talk about um, where Jesus appears to uh, the women, and he also appears to the disciples. And I want to talk about his, his body, because this is important. Okay, so let's go to chapter 28, um, verse 8, and we'll just continue reading on down through till the end. So it says, So the women hurried away from the tomb, and afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away, or stole his body. Well, while we were asleep, if this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some still doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So I'd like to point out that, um, again, he appeared before the women. They uh, bowed down. They grabbed his feet and they actually worshipped him. Uh, again, I have a whole video on why it's appropriate to worship uh, the Son just as you worship the Father. And there's a, a pretty big distinction that, that separates Jesus from other beings. Um, but uh, again, I'll, I'll link to that in the description. Anyways, I want to point out uh, where the guards and the uh, chief priests met with the elders and they devised this plan to come up with a lie that Jesus' disciples came in the middle of the night and they stole his body, okay, to, to substantiate the, uh, the three days claim that Jesus made. So, again, the Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jehovah just dissolved Jesus' body and then Jesus started making fake bodies and appearing all over the place uh, to the disciples over the course of 40 days. So anytime he was with them, it was a spirit fake body, okay? The problem with that is if the body was just dissolved, <laughs> sorry, let's just talk about the chief priests lying about the physical body being removed from the tomb because that had implications. If Jesus' physical body came back to life, he would be the Messiah, 
okay? He would do exactly what he said he was going to do. So if he didn't come back physically, then he's a liar. This whole, this whole thing is a, is a sham. The way that the Jewish people understood resurrection was a physical resurrection. There was no aspect of, about it that was spiritual. So with that in mind, we're going to go to uh, two other things, but I just I want to say specifically that, that Jesus, his own words, he even refutes this uh, false teaching of coming back in a um, spirit body. Okay, next verse, talking about a physical appearance of Jesus in a physical body. So this is going to be from Luke chapter 24, um, and I'm going to go ahead and read verse 36 through 49. So hope you didn't come for a quick video today. <laughs> All right, here we go. It says, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking that they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled and why do you doubt? Why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, and while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and he ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled. That is written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so that they could understand the Scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. <laughs> they actually are afraid. They think that Jesus is a spirit. They think he's a ghost. That's why they're afraid. And he has to tell them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. The hands and feet, the, the, the nail marks, was the proof that it was his body. They saw him crucified. They would have, <laughs> so it was proof. He's not just making a fake body with fake wounds. This is not what's happening. This is his body, resurrected and glorified. And then he even goes so far as to say, touch me and see a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And then he pushes it even further and he shows them that he can eat because the spirit, apparently a spirit can't do that. Um, so that's one of his further proofs. So not only does he say it and then he shows them by having them handle him. And then on top of it, he asks for fish to eat. So he gives like four different witnesses essentially, that, that this is him, his body, resurrected physically. All right, let's belabor the point, shall we? Okay, uh, next verse that we're going to read that is talking again about the, the physical manifestation of Jesus Christ's resurrected and glorified body. This is going to be from John chapter 20, and it's going to be 24 through 31. So it says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So, you know, Thomas, Thomas makes a, he puts forward a charge. He says, unless I put my finger into the nail marks in his hands and I put my, my hand into his side, I can't believe this, this crazy claim that you guys are, are making. 
because he saw Christ crucified. There's no way anyone's coming back from that, right? No matter how much I want to believe it. And then Jesus appears specifically and tells him, go ahead, do all those things. And then after he proves himself, uh, Thomas bows down. He, he reveres him not only as his Lord, but as his God, which again is okay to do if you understand Jesus. So um, it's getting pretty overwhelming here that this is a physical body. But let's go to one last instance, and then we're going to go ahead and move into the verses that are talking about the imparting of the Holy Spirit and that being an important part of um, an evidence for salvation, an indicator that someone is saved. All right, here we go, guys. Last verse, and again, we're, um, we're building a mosaic. We're putting together stacks of evidence uh, that talk about the, the physical body of Jesus Christ uh, that was resurrected. So we're going to go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and that's going to be verses 3 through 19. So uh, it says, actually, let's go 1 through 19. It says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received on and which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you have believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Wow. So, if you're a Jehovah's Witness and you're listening to this right now, I need you to take a step back, ignore your programming, and just listen very intently to what I'm about to say. What the Apostle Paul is addressing here is that some people, I think it was the Gnostics, were saying, you know, a resurrection of the dead had something to do with being a disembodied spirit, disembodied out of the body. You're just a spirit creature now. You're no longer physical. So, Paul is arguing against that false teaching. The reason he's arguing against it is because he's saying that we have told you that Christ came back physically. If he didn't come back physically, then there is no resurrection of the dead. So listen to me, Jehovah's Witness, listening to this. If this is you, you have a hope that one day you and your loved ones who are in the organization will be resurrected physically, not as a spirit body. What Paul is saying in this letter is that Jesus came back physically resurrected, which is why we have hope. And if he didn't come back physically, and he came back as a disembodied spirit, as the Watchtower teaches, then we have no hope of physical resurrection. So you, you have two teachings inside of your brain right now that should be butting heads. If Jesus didn't come back physically, you're not coming back physically. So your hope is gone. And we should be pitied more than anyone else. Okay? So we have to draw a conclusion here. Either Paul is crazy, and he's arguing for something that doesn't need to be argued for, or the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, his body being physical, is kind of a big deal. So my next question is, can you trust an organization 
that teaches these lies about Jesus. They're not just misunderstandings. I mean, they have been over this and over this and over this. These are not just misunderstandings. These are false teachings. And it's being done purposefully. So you need to ask yourself, is this God's one true organization? If they're getting this part, this very, very important part wrong. I'm going to tell you why it's very important. We're going to continue on now with the imparting of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Again, the Watchtower teaches that only the 144,000, the anointed ones, are the ones who are going to receive the Holy Spirit. The rest of us just get sort of like a little, little sprinkle effect. You know, we all get a little bit of Holy Spirit, but we don't get the Holy Spirit like the 144,000 do. Well, that was an important distinction, an important uh, aspect of the first century church. So we're going to go over some of the verses that talk about that, um, the imparting of the Holy Spirit. But first, we're going to go through some of the chapters that talk about the true gospel of uh, Jesus Christ. And we're going to break those down uh, so you can start to understand what the good news even is. Because I bet if I asked you, you know, what is the good news, I would get a crazy answer that has nothing to do with what the first century church was telling people. I, it's sad but true. I've asked my own family. They can't give me the good news. So anyways, let's go ahead and uh, dive into true examples of the gospel in the book of Acts. Okay, so let's go to the uh, first instance where the, the Holy Spirit um, is poured out on the disciples, or the they that were there. And we'll talk about the, the they, who it's probably referring to. Okay, so um, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the disciples the day of Pentecost, also known as the Feast of Weeks. This is supposed to happen 40-something days after the week of Passover. Um, so this would ha this would correlate with Jesus appears to the disciples over the course of 40 days, and then he ascends into heaven, and he tells them that they're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He tells them to wait in Jerusalem. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just uh, read about the they real quick um, from Acts 1, so we can try and figure out who is there. Okay, so this is Acts 1, uh, verse 13 and 14. It says, When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and, An and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Z uh, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. <clears throat> that That's the they who's being talked about now. We're going to go over to chapter 2, and we're going to read um, verses 2, 3, and 4. Okay. Now let's just go 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. They were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came down from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Okay, so what do we got? Day of Pentecost, they're all gathered in Jerusalem. They hear a great rushing wind sound and then fire, tongues of fire appear above over each one of their heads and they start speaking in other languages. Now this is important. Apparently this sound, this rushing wind, was so powerful and so crazy, it brought people, it was big enough that it brought people to this location. They're like, what in the world was that, okay? Um, so then they get to this location and they see the disciples or the they that were gathered there and they're speaking in various languages. Now check this out. I'm going to throw up a graph real quick, and this is actually from my Bible. And um, <laughs> this might be a little bit hard to make out. I don't know. Maybe you get it straight away. The parts that have the little black dots in them, those are actually oceans, and the white parts are land, geographical land. <laughs> I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that. It took me a minute to see that. Okay. So you see Jerusalem here in the um, just off to the center right. And you see all of these arrows pointing to Jerusalem. These are all people who were Jewish converts or God-fearing people who had journeyed to Jerusalem for the Feast of Weeks or for Pentecost, which is, I think it's just the Greek name for Feast of Weeks. So look, we got people as far as Rome, uh, 
Elma, Medea, Arabia, Egypt, Cyrene, Crete. I mean, look at, look at how many people came. And these are the people that are about to receive the gospel. They're about to receive the Holy Spirit. And then they're going to go take it back to their countries. I mean, this is, this is a huge opportunity. This is a huge explosion. It's almost like, you know, God's timing, <laughs> if you will. I just think that this part is amazing. So anyways, the reason I'm bringing this up is because they hear something miraculous and it's this crazy sound. They go to the location, they hear something even more miraculous. Here are these men who are born in very specific areas and they shouldn't be speaking all these languages. It makes zero sense that they know this many languages, okay? So some people are amazed, other people are like, they're drunk. Again, guys, there's always gonna be mockers, who cares? Be a mocker, I, I feel bad for you. But the other people who are so amazed by this, they're asking, how is this even possible? And what does Peter do? He addresses the crowd with the good news of Jesus Christ. Real quick, I just wanna say this. So we have, we have this miracle of the rushing wind. We have the miracle of men speaking in languages that they should not know, but they're able to speak them and they're proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. This miracle gets the attention of this many people at this perfect time in history, right? This would have been the absolute choicest time for them to give the good news, all right? And let me just give you a version of the good news and you tell me if it stands up. This would have been the perfect time to tell the crowd that there is one God and his name is Jehovah and his son is Jesus, who is right now Michael the Archangel. And there is a time in the future that Jehovah and Jesus will come down to a place that you have not yet heard of called North America. And they will choose a group of people to be God's people and to be his sole representative and channel on earth. And by being a part of that group, you will survive the wrath of God at the Battle of Armageddon. And you'll get to live in a perfect body in a place called paradise. And also you can have a pet tiger. Maybe I shouldn't be flippant, but that's the good news of the Jehovah's Witnesses in a nutshell. You'll get to pet a tiger one day, swim with the sharks. Okay, I don't mean to belittle it, but that is not the gospel. Um, that's not the good news. That's not inspiring. I don't know, maybe it's inspiring to some people. It, it wasn't good enough. It wasn't truthful enough. Let me go ahead and just... Um, I'm going to recite Peter's gospel from chapter 2, verse 38. Now, I, I would really encourage you, go to chapter 2, read 14. I would go all the way through verse 39. Get all the way to 40, okay? I would encourage you to read that entire thing for yourself. Peter has to explain why Jesus was innocent, how... Uh, the religious leaders are the ones who condemned him to death, um, that he was crucified, that he was buried, that he was dead for three days, and that he resurrected. And all of this was prophesied by the prophets, um, and it came to pass, and now we have the good news. Okay, so he, he has to explain all of that, and I would encourage you to read chapter two, Acts chapter 2, 14 through 40, okay? But I'm going to go down to 38. So this is at the end of him addressing the crowd. And here's the good news in a nutshell. It says, 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So it says, with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. That day. Not six months of studying the Bible, a year of studying the Bible, going out in field service, becoming a unbaptized publisher, then a baptized publisher, finally. That day they heard the good news and they repented and they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So that's the first instance where we get the real gospel. I'm going to direct you to um, just a couple other chapters where uh, the true gospel is spoken about in, in the book of Acts. Um, it's, it's everywhere, by the way, but these are just a couple instances. So uh, chapter 3, Peter heals a crippled beggar and he tells them about Jesus. Like, the, who... 
gave him the ability to heal that crippled beggar, it was in Jesus' name. And then he gives them the good news. Uh, chapter 4, the Pharisees and Sadducees aren't very happy about that. So Peter and John are dragged before the Sanhedrin. They proclaim Jesus, even going so far as saying salvation is found in no one else, and you cannot be saved by no other name. Uh, so that's Acts 4, chapter 12. In fact, that's one of my favorite verses. So let's go ahead and read that real quick. It says, Then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone or the cornerstone. Here we go, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Wow. Okay, one more time, Jehovah's Witness. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. They didn't say eventually there will be another name that we have to learn. Guys, they could have been pointing to the Tetragrammaton. They could have been saying Yahweh. Um, now, again, them being Jews who grew up being Jews forever, they actually had more reverence for God's name than we, than we do. So they probably would have said Adonai instead of saying uh, Yahweh. But notice the name that they're being persecuted for is Jesus' name. So that's always been my question is why, why choose or land on the name Jehovah's Witnesses? Why not Yahweh's Witnesses? Why not Jesus' Witnesses? Because, I mean, we have plenty of instances where Jesus tells them that they're going to be his witnesses and they're going to proclaim his name. So why is Jesus pulling people away from Jehovah's name? Why does he have the right to do that? Okay, either... It's that we're supposed to put our faith in the Lord Jesus, okay, which gets us the Father, which gets us the Holy Spirit. Jesus is our mediator, or Jesus is speaking blasphemy. And I'm sorry, but when you come back from the grave, I tend to think that you're telling the truth, especially if you predicted that that would happen. So if we go to Acts chapter 5, um, it says that they healed and they exercised. When it says they, they healed, we're talking about the apostles. They healed and exercised many sicknesses and evil spirits. Um, and because of it, they were brought to jail again. They were freed by an angel, which is really cool. And then they went right back to the market and or, or the temple, I think. And then they started to proclaim Jesus' name again. And um, so now they've already been arrested, right? So they, they get pulled back in front of the Sanhedrin uh, not forcefully, because they were afraid that the people had seen all these miracles and heard about all these miracles, so they, they almost couldn't lay their hands on him because they were afraid of a revolt from the people. So they were brought before the Sanhedrin again. And uh, I want to just read you a couple of parts from, from chapter 5, um, verse 28. Sanhedrin talking to the apostles. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Who's that name? I'll just let you take two guesses, Okay. And then we go down to verse 9, uh, Peter and the other apostle, sorry, verse 29, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. And then we move down to verse 32, we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Okay, there's an important distinction there that we'll touch on a little bit later. So, uh, they are wanting to execute them, but they have some guy who's really smart who's a well-respected Pharisee, and he says, listen, don't execute them. If these guys are false, their their false teachings are going to peter out. We've always seen that happen before with some of these other false Jesus guys, right? So um, he just ordered that they be flogged and let go. Otherwise, they'll, they'll make martyrs out of them. The other Pharisees agree. The Sanhedrin agrees. So what they do, it says, verse 40, uh, 540, his speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. I don't want that to pass you real quick. Let's uh, go down to flogged. Beaten with the Jewish penalty of 40 lashes minus one. They were whacked 39 times. Okay, this is the second time that they had been arrested. Do you think that those guys were going easy on them when they were striking them 39 times? I don't think so. Now... 
Let me read that to you again. Now that you know it's 39 wax, his speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged, hit 39 times. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. <laughs> the apostles <clears throat> left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name, whose name? Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Now, do you think when they got those 39 wax and they were like, don't teach in Jesus' name, do you think any one of the apostles turned around and was like, wait, no, <laughs> Jesus, it's Jehovah. You know, like, they <laughs> you don't get whacked for a mistake 39 times and then walk away rejoicing. I would certainly correct the guy if I was waxed 39 times. So these are the questions, guys. These are the questions you have to ask yourself. Why is it that we are so focused on this name of Jehovah? Have we been misled? Why are we not putting the focus where the first century church put it? When I say the first century church, I'm talking about the body of believers, the apostles, and those that they taught, okay? Why were they proclaiming Jesus' name? when they very easily could have been talking about Jehovah, if, if that's the name that people have to know, okay? All right, so now we're gonna continue on to people being imparted with the Holy Spirit. Um, this is an important one, guys. This is very, very important because again, Jesus says that unless a, man is, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom. And he did not mean born twice from his mother, he meant born of the Spirit. So being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we're going to go to a few verses that touch on that now. All right, so this is another important one that we're going to talk about. And again, this is the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Watchtower teaches that only the 144,000, the anointed ones, can receive the Holy Spirit. And they are the ones who are going to rule in heaven with Jesus Christ over the earth. Okay, that's going to be a separate video where I talk about uh, the changes that the Watchtower has actually made to the book of Revelation. And when I say changes, they change words like on, over, upon, and you're like, well, could that really change too much if we just change one little word here and there? Okay, let's just say, is there a difference between Jesus ruling on the earth or over the earth? Does changing that one word change the entire context of the location of where Jesus will be? If you guessed correctly, yes, it certainly does. So we're gonna have a future video where we're gonna point out all of the places where they've actually made changes to the text to make it fit their false teaching. But again, I bring us back to the 144,000. Real quick, let's take a look at who the 144,000 is and let's shatter this with God's word. I'm going to emphasize certain words when I'm reading these verses to prove, to help prove my point. Revelation seven, verse four. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, the 144,000, okay? Right now, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you're getting goosebumps. Listen to this next sentence. From all the tribes of Israel, from the tribe of Judah, 12,000, from the tribe of Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin, 12,000 from each of those Israel tribes from the tribes of Israel. They were also virgin men from the tribes of Israel. So when Sister Smith says that she's part of the 144,000 and she partakes of the bread and the wine at the memorial, that doesn't really seem to fit in with Revelation 7 verses 4. Um, and okay, so if the 144,000 are the only ones who receive the Holy Spirit, they're the anointed ones, then I just need to point out that there's not a single Gentile that can be saved because the evidence that the Gentiles were saved was the impartation of the Holy Spirit. Again, if your teaching is that only the 144,000 can receive the Holy Spirit, then Cornelius's conversion in the book of Acts is null and void. Okay, that was the evidence to the Messianic Jews, the Jews who believed in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, that um, God was actually rescuing Gentiles. Now, 
along with the nation of Israel. It gives you and I the opportunity, even though we're not from the nation of Israel, to be saved, to actually be sons and daughters of the Most High God. So I, I really want to read the entire Acts chapter 10 to you. Um, it would explain in greater detail what it is that I'm talking about, but I don't want this video to be forever long. So I would encourage you, go to Acts chapter 10, read about Cornelius being approached by an angel at the same time that Cornelius is being approached by an angel and told to seek out a man named Peter, Peter is having three of the same vision uh, from God. God is showing him a vision of all of these unclean animals, and he keeps telling him to kill them and eat them. And he's saying, no, Lord, I've eaten nothing unclean. At the same time that he's having those visions, Cornelius' servants have found Peter and are asking him to come to Cornelius' home. Now, not only is Cornelius a Gentile, he is a Roman centurion. He's actually in charge of Roman soldiers. He's a man of great power, but he is from a nation that is actively opposing the Jews. They have invaded their, their land and they are lording over them. So imagine this moment for Peter when he's giving the word of the Lord, which is the good news about Jesus Christ, to a Roman centurion and as he's speaking, I'm going to read for you Acts chapter 10, verse 44. While Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. <clears throat> so again, we're not talking about a, a Jew from the tribe of Levi or the tribe of Judah or any of that. We're talking about a Roman centurion who is a Gentile, who is an opposer, who is an enemy. And his family, his whole family is there with him. They want to hear what, what Peter is uh, telling them because the angel told Cornelius to seek out Peter. All of these people, men and women, are gifted with the Holy Spirit. So again, I, I just don't understand how you can defend this. Only the 144,000, only the anointed are born of the Spirit. Only they are born again. When you have men and women here who are not from any of the, the tribes of Israel who are being given the gift of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and in fact, this was such a pivotal moment in the ministry that Peter received uh, flack from the other apostles when he came back and they heard that he actually stayed in the home of a Gentile because back then that was, that was a no-no. You weren't allowed to do that. So Peter has to go through the whole spiel with them. He has to tell them the whole story that he, an angel appear, appeared to Cornelius, that he had these visions that God was telling him, no, Jesus was telling him to declare nothing unclean uh, that he has made. And then uh, he sees, as he's preaching about Jesus Christ to these people, his death, his burial, his resurrection, that the Holy Spirit comes down upon them. And then he demands that they be baptized. So if I go to Acts chapter 11, and that's 15, uh, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them. He came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. And then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance on to life. Guys, if you don't get the Holy Spirit and you're not born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of Yeshua, our Savior, Jesus. So, we could go through all the instances again where people are seeing a miracle, asking what we must, asking what is this all about, then they turn, they tell the good news of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, resurrection. It's monotonous now at this point. And then what do they do? They say, what must we do? And they say, repent, be baptized, receive the Spirit. Repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. 
Is that the formula for every single believer? If you have the opportunity, yes. If you're the the thief on the cross and he didn't have a chance to, well, he showed a repentant heart. Um, he turned from his ways. He put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ and he was saved. Jesus said, truly, I tell you with this day, you will be with me in paradise. So the, he didn't have an opportunity for water baptism, but you can see that in the book of Acts, that is the order of operations. Again, we, we hear the good news. We respond to it by being repentant, water baptism, receiving the Holy Spirit. Sometimes that, that second part is flipped. They receive the Holy Spirit, then they get water baptized. But all of those things take place and they have to take place, especially if you're in, in a place where you can hear the good news, can repent, can be water baptized, and can receive the Spirit, which can happen at any point. I want to point out a couple other scriptures that talk about them receiving the Holy Spirit, and then we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. So real quick, I want to go again back to Acts chapter 2. This is 38. Again, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Okay, now we're going to go to Acts chapter 8, verse 14. This one's kind of interesting. It says, When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come down upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. To me, this is one of the most interesting instances of salvation that I have read about so far. The people in Samaria, Samaritans, crazy, right? <laughs> Receive the word of Jesus Christ. They put their faith in him. They get water baptized in his name. Peter and John are sent to them to start discipleship. And they realize that none of these people have been imparted with the Holy Spirit. So they pray for them and they lay their hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. So you have people who have heard the good news, who have accepted Jesus Christ, are even water baptized in his name, yet they still need one last pesky little thing to happen. And that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I'm just tongue in cheek. I'm not being flippant about the, the Holy Spirit. So guys, this, I'm confused. I'm very confused. If we call ourselves Bible students, then when we read scripture to scripture, when we read chapter to chapter, how are alarm bells not going off? I understand that the deception is strong. I understand that you're so busy that you don't want to read the Bible chapter to chapter. But you read a Watchtower article or you read an article on JW.org and they quote one or two scriptures and then they have paragraph after paragraph after paragraph telling you what to think about it when they've taken one or two verses out of context and say this proves our point. And yet when I go into scripture and I read verse by verse, chapter to chapter, I'm starting to think that they don't know what they're talking about, that they aren't actually Bible students, that they might just be a book publishing company that is making a great deal of money right now off of all of their followers and the free labor, the free labor, the, the free marketing by the Jehovah's Witnesses, the, ind the individual rank and file, AKA possibly you in this moment, who is going door to door, who's pointing people to JW.org, who's pointing other people to become followers and, and give up portions of their paycheck for this book publishing company so that they can have this wonderful little paradise up in Warwick, New York, where they're just going to spend all day long making propaganda videos so that they can continue to brainwash this generation and the next generation and the next generation. Guys, I've only read a couple of chapters of the book of Acts, and my mind is blown. But if you want to know what the gospel is, read the book of Acts. Read it chapter to chapter, verse by verse. It will blow your mind. It is my favorite book of the Bible right now. I'm absolutely in love, but I'm so in love with the boldness and the faith that these people have 
because it trumps anything I've ever done in my life. And I want to be like these Christians. So I hope you guys found this video helpful. Um, I know it's long. I know I am so long winded when I speak. There's so much guys. There's so much information. There's so many different trails we could go down. I love God's word. And I love how it proves itself over and over and over again. He will not be defeated. He has already seen every argument, every false teaching brought up against him before he even created the first molecule. And he already knows how to fight it. So guys, I hope that this video has blessed you. And um, as always, I appreciate your comments down in the comment section below. I actually think I'm going to divide this big video up into smaller parts as well so that we can uh, maybe make it a little bit more digestible to people who are just getting into this. But I appreciate those of you who are into long form conversation because that's my, that's my speed. That's my cup of tea. Anyways, guys, I want to thank you so much again and uh, God bless you.